I hope you guys don't mind that I'm having some lactose free cookies and cream ice cream, cookies and cream ice cream while I watch this while I watch the scandalous murder of William Desmond Taylor. Let's see let's see how he died. That's on full screen. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we investigate the murder of William Desmond Taylor, a notable film director in 1920s Hollywood. Let's peek behind the curtain. Have I heard about this one? The glitz and the glamour. Well, but you know what they say. Not all glitz and glamour. Well, you just said that, right? Yeah. No, uh, I don't know how else to restate it. Sometimes people get murdered in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into it. Hollywood, February 2nd, 1922. <laughs> The crime, murder, and what would become one of the biggest scandals to rock early Hollywood. The victim, film director William Desmond Taylor, known by his friends as Bill, born in Carlow, Ireland on mm. April 26, 1872. Directing more than 40 films for what is now known as Paramount and working with tin I just realized that this is a murder case that took a hun that took place uh, like a hundred years ago. Tinseltown's brightest stars, Taylor was well liked, respected, and seen as a leading filmmaker. Taylor himself even starred in one of the first feature films that would define Hollywood and would later serve as president of the Motion Picture Directors Association for several years. By all accounts, William Desmond Taylor was a glimmering beacon in the cinema firmament. 40 movies in 1920 equates to two weeks of work? Yeah, because they did. <laughs> this movie's called Man uh -huh. Rocks Potato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there, and there was like shooting like 10 movies at the same time in the same room. Uh -huh. No sound. He's got six uh, cigars in yeah. his mouth. He's operating seven different cameras. Mm -hmm. He also acted in one, um, and that became a Hollywood classic. Was he a good actor? He only acted in one, so. so gonna, nope. He was well, a big a deal movie. back then, all right? Okay. Well, leave WDT alone. Okay. Jesus. Well, he's oh, going to be dead I'm soon. Not calling into question his talent. Yeah. Or his reputation. This is coming from the, the auteur <laughs> of Dogs Watch Television for the first time. It's oh, a good video. <laughs> Picture, if you will, the scene of the crime. Nestled on the corner of the. Speaking of dogs watching TV, there's a TV channel specifically for dogs. Like, it's. Tuned to the dog's eyesight. That is kind of silly. Of Alvarado and Maryland, in the posh LA neighborhood of Westlake Park, sits the luxurious apartment of William Desmond Taylor. The time, 7.30 a.m., February 2nd. Taylor's valet, Henry Peavy, arrives at his usual time to make breakfast for Taylor. He makes this Upon breakfast? opening the door, Peavy spots the obscured feet of his boss on the ground. He calls out to Taylor. No response. Creeping in a bit farther, PB discovers to his horror the body of William Desmond Taylor, fully dressed, lying face up with blood around his mouth. No sign of a struggle is immediately apparent. It's assumed he died of natural causes. What PB natural causes? The neighbors, many of them. <sighs> What natural causes causes blood to come out of your mouth? The only one I can think of is like tur is tuberculosis. Hollywood stars and starlets themselves, who gradually shuffle into Taylor's apartment. And yeah, like crime scene contamination. Well, Let's he, get a load of this bloody man. Well, the thing is, he lived in an apartment complex that was very luxurious, and there was a lot of people who were already in Hollywood living next door. That's fun. It was a, a wild scene. Also, the it last thing. It was a wild scene. It is. The last thing you want when there's a crime scene that's fresh is everybody shuffling in in their fucking night Walking robes. in with cosmopolitan. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. Oh, I wonder what's going on here. Ugh, gross blood. Oh, I got on my shoe. Let me rub it off on this carpet. That kind of thing. Yeah. You know, you don't want that in a crime scene. 8 a.m. The police arrive on the scene. Took them long enough. 40 a.m. Coroner William McDonald arrives to move and examine the body, and it becomes quite obvious this death was not due to natural causes. They lift Taylor's body to reveal a pool of blood staining the carpet where Taylor lay. 
a 38 caliber bullet had entered the left side of his back. Based on the placement of the bullet holes in Taylor's jacket and vest, officials conclude that his arms were raised at the time he was shot. Bizarrely, the police would later consider this could mean Taylor was embracing somebody who then shot him in the back. Meaning they shot him while they were hugging him. Then, boom. I, what did you, or, or just from the, like, no, but he got shot in the back and went through the back. In the back, that seems awkward, right? Also, yeah. wouldn't you shoot yourself? Would you shoot yeah. yourself? I don't know, bullets, do they stay in a body or do they just go? No, yeah, they a, stay in a body, right? There's, oh, there's exit wounds sometimes. Yeah. And this one had an exit wound. So it would it would have sh shot that person. Shot the person. Unless they planned it so that they were like, kind of like an Olay situation where he's like, da, and they move like that. Oh, like. Phew. Yeah, they like running with the bullets. Like that. Yeah. Except it's a bullet. Police also supposedly find a silky garment, pinkish in color, that, quote, resembled a nightgown, end quote. Detective Sergeant Edward King later tells reporters he thinks it belonged to a woman. A robbery is ruled out, as Taylor's wallet was left behind with $78 cash inside, as well as other valuable items in the home. Shortly after the discovery of the bullet wound, the Alvarado court apartments are filled with reporters oh, and photographers geez. from every LA newspaper, as well as several papers outside of LA. Amidst the chaos of the crime scene, one detail worth mentioning is the fact that before the police and reporters arrived, Paramount studio manager Charles Aiden oh, visited man. the crime yeah. scene upon hearing the news. This, it's believed that Aiden sus. removed evidence from Taylor's apartment that morning in an attempt to avoid or at least minimize the scandal. Some even believe he may have planted false evidence such as pink Dude. lingerie, perhaps to hide the fact that, as one theory had it, Taylor was a homosexual. Detective Sergeant Edward King, who was assigned to the Taylor case, is among those who believed Paramount was taking measures to keep silent their stars, who may have had useful information on the chance that it would implicate them. When considering the roster of stars associated with the case, the motive for the studio interfering was quite strong. Though, this only leads to more questions. What was Aiden cleaning up? And whom was he covering for? So studio heads back then, sort of playing God. Yeah, it was, it yeah. Was sort of, yeah, like a little bit of a God complex. Anytime in uh, a prime a major in studio, crime uh, scenes. a person in the position of power starts tampering with uh, with any kind of case like this, things aren't what they seem, obviously. All bets are off. Got those dirty, dirty Hollywood fingers all over. This is like yeah. a classic dirty Hollywood yeah. story. It stinks, man. It stinks, yeah. All the way up to the top. It's making my mouth dry. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at the night before the body is discovered. The night that Taylor was shot. 7.45 p.m. Hollywood comedy star Mabel Norman, the last person known to have seen Taylor alive, leaves Taylor's home and is driven off by her chauffeur, William Davis. 8 p.m., a sound that could have been a gunshot is heard by actor and neighbor Douglas McLean and his wife, Faith. This possible gunshot is also heard by apartment manager E.C. Jesserin, who writes it off as a misidentification when no other disturbance follows. At first I thought that's a what bit suspicious, the fuck? but then the more I thought about it, I, 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 was, I was thinking... You write it off. Last night I was in my apartment and in the hallway I heard what at first I thought was a woman yeah. like maybe in pain or in distress. Mm -hmm. At first it was, ah, and I was like, oh no, is someone in my building in trouble? Yeah. And then I just put my ear by the door and it changed to, it could have been someone in distress, but my brain immediately was like, mm, I think someone's having sex in the elevator. I, <laughs> and then the elevator door closes, and I stopped hearing anything, so. It's a bit much to confront the fact that, hey, maybe someone's being murdered right now. It's so a you lot. take the, you're, you're, you maybe not consciously, you, you take the easy way out, much like you take yeah. the easy way out when you're uh, confronted with ghost evidence. Oh, when? Right? Not the season for choose, it. Uh, not the season. Choose pivoting. Nope. <laughs> Thought I'd make that point. Let's not discuss that this season. After hearing this sound, 
Faith McQueen spots a man outside Taylor's home. She does not get a good look at the man's face, but sees that he is clean shaven, white, of medium build, around five foot nine, and dressed in dark clothing and a cap. She would later say, quote, he was dressed like my idea of a motion picture burglar, end quote. Sounds like a hunk. <laughs> right? Well, it sounds like someone went to Party City and was like, make me look like a criminal. You have a cape? He didn't have a cape, it wasn't Zorro. The man seems to notice Faith watching him, but does not appear to be alarmed or in any hurry. Faith sees the man look back into Taylor's home for a moment, as if saying goodbye. Then, the man leaves, closing Taylor's door behind him. At the time, that was a murderer. Faith does not think much of it. I don't know how she didn't think much of that. You say he's dressed like a cat burglar. Uh, he's poking around this guy's house. You heard something that sounded like a gunshot. I think all those things together may make me think a little bit about it. What if he was just turning around, though, and he, like it looked like he was saying goodbye, but what if he just sort of did a double take, like, that's a wrap? 8.15 <laughs> p.m., Howard Fellows, Taylor's chauffeur at the time of his death, moves Taylor's car into the garage. When he goes to drop off the keys at Taylor's apartment, Taylor does not answer his door, despite the lights being on inside. It's assumed by police that Taylor was already dead mm. at this time. The next day, police would find six cigarette butts in the alley behind Taylor's and the McLean's apartments. The McLean's maid, Christina Jewett, heard footsteps in this alley around the time of the supposed gunshot. Perhaps the killer bided his time until he saw an opportunity to strike. Why is this unsolved? Well, I mean, seems like a Seems like they're really zeroing in here. Well, we don't know who the man is. Oh. And most importantly, we don't know if the man was acting independently. Mmm. Looks like you're jumping to conclusions. Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that detective mind of yours isn't a strong detective. No, no, no. It's, uh, it's pretty right. strong. Pretty strong. I have a strong brain. Also of note was the testimony of two men who claimed an unknown man inquired where Taylor lived around 6 p.m. on the night of the murder at a nearby gas station. The man's description was similar to Faith McLean's, although this man was wearing a dark suit. Yeah, he's at a gas station? He's at a gas station Maybe near. buying more smokes. Or gassing up his car. He's back. He's back. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was talking about, he was asking where Taylor lived. He was at a gas station near where Taylor lived already. Wait, he was asking where to? He was asking these two men at a gas station at 6 p.m., two hours before the gunshot, yeah. where Taylor lived. Oh, I missed that part entirely. <laughs> I guess the detective mind is actually not there at all. Oh, interesting. Exiting the events of that night, let's examine odd events that perhaps foreshadowed Taylor's demise. Towards the end of 1921, Taylor had received several mysterious and unnerving phone calls seemingly with nobody on the other end of the line when he answered. That's creepy. Taylor's home was robbed on December 4th, 1921. The thief had taken jewelry and the special imported cigarettes Taylor smoked, which had gold tips. On December 27th, he received a strange package. And for more details on that, let's get in to our first suspect. The first suspect is Edward F. Sands, who had previously served as Taylor's secretary slash valet slash cook. In 1921, Sands had forged checks from Taylor for more than $5,000, also taking jewelry and clothing before eventually disappearing. Sands had previously been court-martialed for embezzlement and dishonorably discharged from the U.S. Navy. According to actress Claire Windsor, Taylor had voiced his intention to kill Sands if he ever saw him again. $5,000 back then is actually quite a bit of cash. Yep. Yeah. So, oh, so Taylor was going to kill him. It's still quite a bit of cash for me since I'm self-employed. Him? Yeah, because he had stolen so much from him. That's so strange. Do you think he meant it? I mean, it could have been like, I'm going to kill him next time I see him. And you see him and you're like, hey. I, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. I, I can't imagine he'd see him at like the Copacabana and just, just blood on gun yeah. shoot him. Yeah. No, I think it was he was angry with him. Was what he said. Uh, 
This is just demonstrating that there is bad blood between the two of them. Yes. This conversation was several days before Taylor himself was murdered. Further demonstrating a grudge, Sands had spent time digging up dirt on Taylor's private life before finally absconding with his money. This snooping brings us to one of the weirdest twists in the case, the revelation that Taylor wasn't who he said he was, and Sands perhaps knew it. As mentioned before, Taylor had received a strange package on December 27th. The package was postmarked from Stockton, California, and contained a pawn slip for the jewelry that was stolen on December 4th. The pawn slips had been signed William Deanne Tanner, I'm gonna be right back. I'm just gonna quickly grab myself a blanket because I'm cold. <laughs> and yes, I know I'm eating ice cream, it's just that my room's cold. which, as Taylor's murder investigation would reveal, was Taylor's real name. Along with the pawn slip was a note that read, quote, so sorry to inconvenience you, even temporarily. Also, observe the lesson of the forced sale of assets, a Merry Christmas, and a happy and prosperous New Year, end quote. Also notable was the name used to sign the note, quote, alias Jimmy B, end quote. This could possibly be a reference to the film Alias Jimmy Valentine, a movie about a thief who frequently eludes the cops. More importantly, this note suggests the thief, possibly Sands, stole the jewelry and then pawned it off using Taylor's real name to taunt him. As Sands what likely knew, you. there was a reason Taylor had changed his name. Before making the change, Taylor had started and deserted a family. Oh, a past dude! He had hidden to preserve his reputation. Perhaps <sighs> knowing this, Sans sent this note and jewelry pawn slips to mock Taylor. It's worth mentioning the handwriting on this note was similar to Sans. Police attempted to lure Sans to Los Angeles via a woman he dated, a ploy that did not work. Yeah, and police he's were never too able smart. to question too smart their to do major that. suspect. So he, I mean, it very well likely could be him. They just never were able to catch him. He's a greasy one. They just couldn't find him. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's the 1920s. It must be harder to find yeah. people. Yeah, I guess you just go find a tree to sit under somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think you're pretty fucked once he gets past the state board. Yeah. Tell him, uh, Hi there, my name's uh, Ricky Goldsworth. Ricky Goldsworth. Mm -hmm. You know, if you ever get tired of doing this, you can just move to a new town, tell him your name is Ricky Goldsworth, yeah. you're done, you're set for life. Yeah, I'd tell him that. I want the top house. I want the top room. You can't just move into a town. No, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah. so you yeah, can't yeah, just yeah, move yeah. into a town and take a house. I don't think you heard me. But I want the best house in the neighborhood. I want it stocked with food, Sir. furnished, and I want servants as well. I want butlers, and you're going to be one sir, of them. Sir, you can't. You're I'm gonna not going to be a butler. I'm the mayor, sir. No, that's not how this is going down. Oh, shit. Your outfit's in my car. I'll expect you at my house later, 8 a.m. Leave the keys under the mat. Yes, sir, Mr. Goldsworth. <sighs> Good Goldsworth. What a story. Gold Goldsworth really coming into his own. You talking to me? No. <laughs> <laughs> the second suspect is Mabel Normand, the queen of comedy. Mabel was the last known person to see Taylor alive, and it had been long rumored that Mabel and Taylor were intimate, a fact that Mabel denied. Though, it's easy to see why this was believed. One of the valuables found in Taylor's pocket was a silver locket containing a photo of Mabel Normand engraved with, quote, to my dearest, end quote. Mabel also admitted that she and Taylor had exchanged letters, which the press dubbed the, quote, blessed baby letters, end quote, named after Taylor's pet name for Mabel, which she used when signing her letters to him. However, I have a quick question about the lockets. Why do people have lockets if they're so fucking hard to open? I mean, 
I think I had a locket, but I could like never really get that thing open unless I tried for like 10 minutes. So I eventually just like stopped using that thing. Also, I was like five at the time. The letters were not found at Taylor's apartment. Some believe these letters could have been among the evidence removed from Taylor's apartment by studio manager Charles Aiden. I, I think it's pretty certain that they were in his house when they were removed, which doesn't look good. The studio yeah. had removed these love letters between Mabel and... Yeah, so she would sign her letters, Bless Baby. Bless Baby. Weird thing that was his, Well, that was his yeah. pet name for her, which is oh, Blessed Baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gross. Why does the studio head care? That's the question you should be asking. Why should he care that Mabel Norman is placed inside his apartment several times with these letters possibly? Mm -hmm. why, is, why does he care That's about the That's a good question. Mabel said she wouldn't have minded if people read them, but thought that they might be, quote, misunderstood. End quote. Is our said as what? would eventually turn over some of Taylor's personal papers to the police, but it's possible that he still retained papers the studio didn't want them to see. Well, also, what the shit? Why, why don't they just get a, like, a search warrant and go to this dude's house and yeah. say, hey, man, give us everything? He owns the law, man. Oh, you're, he, you're the, you think that like the studio owns the police, like yeah. they're in the pocket? Yeah, of course they are. Maybe they're in I mean, a couple pockets. Sure. Have you ever seen L.A. Confidential? L.A. cops back in the day were in the pocket of the powerful men in the city. That's a fictional film. Yeah, I know. On February 9th, the blessed baby letters were turned over to the chief deputy DA, W.C. Doran. After causing such a fuss, what did these letters say, you might ask? Of what yeah. I could find, and also of what was actually handed over, one read, quote, Sorry I cannot dine with you tomorrow because I have a previous engagement with a Hindu prince. Some other time, blessed baby, end quote. Not exactly a criminal manifesto. That's the most random no. thing ever. Hey, we've all been to dinner with a Hindu prince. Yeah, yeah, right? That's just something you do. Uh, what a life she's leading. So this could either be, A, these letters were, in fact, very suspicious, mm -hmm. and not all of them were handed over, or B, she was kind of worried that this may make it seem like they're in a relationship, overreacted and by her overreacting and saying he's maybe misunderstood it actually made her look more uh guilty yes at the behest of district attorney thomas lee woolwine detective sergeant king had mabel's home searched in response to a tip that the murder weapon would be found in her house during that search two guns were uncovered but both were 25 caliber and did not match the murder weapon one theory holds that while Mabel didn't murder Taylor herself, Mabel's addiction to drugs, her association with drug dealers, and Taylor's known insistence in helping Mabel get off drugs <coughs> possibly led to someone from Mabel's world doing the job. She was on drugs? Yeah. yeah. She had trouble with alcohol and drugs. To be fair, most of her yeah. had trouble with drugs. Yeah, most of my mom's, most of the mom's, of my mom's side of the family has had trouble with drugs, has had trouble with, with mainly alcohol. My mom had trouble with drugs. And it, that kind of got a little bit inherited to me, because I am addicted to soda. Although I'm cutting back. That's like probably New Year's resolution. Exactly. It was fact, just like amphetamines or something? Yeah. It was an old timey drug? I'm not sure what the drugs were, but I know mm -hmm. that most of Hollywood at the time was under the influence of drugs, and Taylor was a crusader in terms of that. He, he was against it. He was trying to clean Hollywood up. Pretty boring for him to be that way. Well, uh, I, I mean, I maybe boring enough. Maybe all of like Hollywood it. ganged up on him. I mean, that's like, this guy's a real buzzkill. Captain Edward A. Salisbury, an explorer and colleague of Taylor's, was quoted saying, quote, Billy Taylor threatened to make an example of the drug peddlers in Hollywood, but they evidently got him first. End quote. The third suspect is Mary Miles Minter, a 19-year-old silent film star who was vocal about her most likely unreciprocated love uh -oh. to Taylor, who had directed her. Crazy girl! A few love letters written by Mary to Taylor were found amongst Taylor's possessions, one of which read, quote, Dearest, I love you, I love you, I love you, X, 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 yours always, Mary. Crazy! Not exactly a poet. 
<laughs> Very insistent. Yeah, that, uh, that's a lot. You know, incriminating, perhaps not. Embarrassing, definitely. Yep. I wouldn't want that. I'd kill someone if, if they were like, <laughs> in public. Other letters were bizarrely written in code, though, when decoded, contained nothing but the written affections of a young girl. Oh my god, that that's thing. cringe! It's kind of code, like a cipher, and when decoded, it was pretty much her uh, telling him she wanted to take long drives with him, sit by the fire and snuff. Boy, I can't imagine why this guy uh, didn't want anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> Another item turned over to police on February 9th was a lace and silk handkerchief embroidered with Mary's initials of MMM. Rumors began that the pink nightgown found in the apartment also had the initials MMM. Oh, Both of dude. these items could possibly place Mary in his apartment at least at some point. Well, so where was the handkerchief? It was in his apartment. In his apartment. And so was apparently this nightgown. If there in fact is a pink nightgown in there with her initials on it, I mean, that looks like maybe it may have been intimate. At the very least, it places her inside his apartment. Yes. Which all the investigators are trying to do. Which, to me, again, is not that suspect, I suppose. You know, I've had people in my apartment who uh, didn't murder me. I, I don't find it that suspicious that the handkerchief was in the apartment, because, I don't know, she seems to have been after him. Maybe I mean, she was over there for a cup of tea at some point. Or maybe she could have mailed it to him. Yeah. Like, here's my scent. I'm a weirdo, remember? Smell it before you go to sleep at night. Think of the drives we might take. I love you. Uh, you decoded the letter, right? Yeah, I'll get to that. I would just no. be like, interesting. I would just be like, be gone with thoughts. I guess throw like a random crochet hook or something at him. Sweet, which I did get a crafting item. Where did we go? I got a crafting kit, but it got misplaced. Mary claimed that she and Taylor had never been intimate. Mary also stated that she did not believe that any of the men she had rebuffed would be jealous enough to kill Taylor. After hearing that Taylor had been shot, Mary showed up at his apartment. In oh Dramatic my God, girl! Reporters took note. I love it. Uh, her showing up in dramatic fashion, though, that's just her, you know, going to the hot party of the... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. If, if all, like you say, all the big stars are there, it's like, oh, oh, and here she comes, sleeping in a fresh puddle of blood. Do you think they were taking selfies of the body or something? Well, maybe, I don't know. Or it seems like... If smartphones existed back then, they would be. Like yeah, it, was, it was the hot ticket. Well, I, I looked at that more with a more incriminating lens. I thought it was her putting on a show to show that she was remorseful. So no. that in the case of a murder investigation, everyone would, take, would have taken note how heartbroken she was. Aside from a possible motive of killing Taylor due to being rejected, there isn't much to implicate Mary. It's more likely her relationship with Taylor boiled down as a way to escape from her overbearing oh stage my mother, God. Shelby, who, by the way, is our fourth and final suspect. Bitch. Charlotte Shelby, mother of Mary Miles Minter, pushed her daughter into acting uh, She does not look thrilled either. was actually originally named Juliet, and Shelby even went as far as having Mary steal the identity of a dead cousin named Mary Minter. Oh to my god. Juliet older on paper. What so the that fuck? Mary slash Juliet could continue working. From then on, Juliet went by Mary Miles Minter. Classic stage mom. That is fucking insane. Yeah. We, we've talked about stage moms before. I think it's a little strange to take your little child Dress them up like a little pony. Put them out on a stage. Oh, dance for the people. Dance. Dance. You're three years old. Dance for them and make sure you refer to yourself by the name of your dead cousin. It's very strange. <laughs> it's one thing to have a stage name, right? Yeah. It's another thing to steal the identity of a dead family member. Yeah. So that you could go uh, re recite Hamlet. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's fucking strange. I don't think she was reciting Hamlet. You get what I'm saying, you <laughs> Shelby was a reported suspect because she'd been angry with Taylor for her belief that he deflowered her uh, daughter. No. When Charlotte Shelby learned of this, she started several arguments with Taylor for getting too close to her daughter. Shelby's relationship with her daughter was already strained to begin with, and it's conceivable that there was jealousy that she was losing her daughter to an older man. According to some accounts, Shelby had even threatened to kill Taylor on more than one occasion if he got too close to Mary again. 
both an author of a book on the case, as well as a film director who planned to adapt the case into a film, believe that Shelby is the most likely culprit. If you'll recall, police speculated that Taylor was shot during an embrace. Perhaps that embrace was a faux olive branch extended by Shelby to Taylor to lure him into a trap. She's the only one I could see who would have fake hugged him so she could shoot him. Yeah. Yeah. Because maybe it's like bury the hatchet. It's okay that you're dating my daughter. I approve. You're dead. Because I like yeah. this lady as a suspect. I, a lot of people like her as a suspect. Yeah. God, I love the hug murder. <laughs> That's good. It is, Especially right? Especially if it's her, you know, I'm, I'm picturing like Angelica Houston. Yeah. You know, just sort of embra you know, just, just embracing you know, his eyes. And then, yeah, while their hand is there, putting your hand back, taking the gun from the back. Yeah. It doesn't even seem very logical or effective. I feel like you're more likely to shoot yourself. But, yeah. You know, old Hollywood, she was a stage mom. She liked theatricality. There were rumors yeah. that Shelby and District Attorney Woolwine were friends and perhaps romantically interested in one another, opening the door for some to suspect a cover. So much romance bullshit. Is this with the detective? The district attorney. District attorney? Yeah. They were just like, a dame, huh? <laughs> I guess I'll cover up a murder for her, as long as she's smooching me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Put yeah. a bunch of files into the garbage. Yeah. And that's a cover up. Cover what you can, yeah. make some more pictures. Yeah. She seems the most likely suspect to me. Yeah. We, we agree. The only thing I think that's it might have been her. about Charlotte Shelby being the culprit mm -hmm. is that the McLean saw a white male leave the apartment around the time of the gunshot. What if she, what if the guy shot, McL shot the guy, well the guy shot Taylor and he went out the front door as like a diversion while Shelby snuck out like the back or something or snuck out of a, was it on a first story window? A first, if it was like a first story apartment, she could like snuck out the window. I mean, there could have been two people there. I guess she could have hired someone to do the whacking for her. That's true. William Desmond Taylor's high-profile murder continues to baffle. An intertwined web of stardom, lust, jealousy, and rage set against the backdrop of the false facade of glitz and glamour in an immoral Hollywood. In the end, all we can do is take a guess as to who was truly responsible. But for now, the case remains unsolved. Here's a pro tip. If something looks like it might be a crime scene, don't go into it if it looks like a crime scene. You're gonna contaminate shit, and that's not nice for the investigators.